The greatest things in life are worked for, but the best gift of all comes by simple faith. Today, Pastor Lemming speaks again on being a light on a hill. You'll notice that we had a prince as well, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Let me ask you a question. Who is behind the course of this world? Who is behind the trespasses and the sins that we commit? Who is behind all of that evil? It's none other than Satan himself. Satan is the one who introduced sin through Adam into this world. Uh, Satan is the one who is always at work turning people's hearts away from God and away from the things of God, causing us to look away from God and causing us to miss the mark. Satan is the one who's tempting us. And that's the prince that we followed. Our plight was that we were dead. Our pattern was that we were following the course of this world. Our prince was the prince of the air. But notice our practice. He goes on. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once, and here it is, here's our practice, conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You see what he says? When he talks about the flesh, he's not talking about the skin and the bones, the sinews and the muscles and all the arteries and various other parts of our bodies. He's talking about that which is in us that is anti-God. As the world, he means anything outside of us that's anti-God. Now he looks inside of us and he says, whatever's in us that's anti-God. And there's much about us, isn't there? Our, our flesh draws us away after those evil, those evil things. Our flesh lusts after things that God says are forbidden to us. And that becomes the practice of our lives. We conduct ourselves in this fashion. By the way, I should have mentioned as we were going through here, did you notice these are all past tense verbs? in which you once, circle the word once, you'll see it again in a moment, in which you once walked, past tense, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once, past tense, conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by, here comes the third thing, our penalty, we were by nature the children of wrath, just as others, we were the children of wrath. We were deserving of the judgment and the penalty of God. We were deserving of being separated from God forever to pay the penalty for our sins in the lake of fire. We were deserving of all of those things. And he's describing what we were. When we talk about somebody being lost, this is the description of somebody who is lost. This is the description of somebody sometimes who doesn't even understand how desperate their circumstances are, and yet they're dead in their trespasses and sins, and they're following the course of this world, and their prince is the prince of the power of the air, and they're conducting themselves after the lust, those anti-God feelings within themselves, and they're the children of wrath. They're heading toward a penalty that they're going to have to pay. That's what it means to be lost. And if we're children of God, that's what we were before we came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was what was true of us. It doesn't mean you were as bad as you could possibly be, but it means that every aspect of your life has been touched by the sinfulness that you inherited all the way back to Adam. I thought it was interesting, a little story to illustrate the fear that can overcome us when we find ourselves in this lost condition. A story about five or six college students that uh, every weekend, not every weekend, but many weekends when they were uh, living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they were going to college, they would go what they called spelunking. You know what that is? That's what I used to call caving, but they call it spelunking these days. They would scout out a place. There would be an opening in the side of the mountain, and they would crawl through that opening, and they would go wherever that, that crawl space would take them, back into the caverns that were deep within that mountain. About 10 o'clock on weeknights, they would get their grubbiest clothes and their headlights on, and they'd get a few snacks, and they'd head off to that place, that spot where they'd all agreed to meet. 
Once inside that cave, they found that there were tight, there were, there were tight crawl spaces. There were sometimes vast caverns. There were underground rivers. There was foul-smelling mud. And, of course, the ever-present, what, bats that were inside of that cave. And they had a rule. The rule was that we always stay together. I've never been caving, but apparently when you're inside of these caves, the echoes can be deceiving as to where the voice is actually coming from. And consequently, their rule was that we will always stay together. With five or six of these college students, we will always stay together. And one of the things they were very careful to do was to always mark the entranceway as they came in so that they could find their way back out. They would take some ribbon, red ribbon, and they would tie it to various things inside the cave as they were making their way back into the cave so that they could find their way back out. In the dark, early morning hours on this one particular day, they got lost in that cave, and they couldn't find their markers to get back out. And one of the students writing about this says, we were lost. We were lost And he said to make matters worse, that their lantern batteries were quickly fading out. They weren't going to last much longer. And these are his words. I read them word for word. I remember to this day lying on my back in a crawl space, staring at the rock just inches above my face as my light flickered dimly and feeling raw fear seize my thoughts. We only had about 30 more minutes at the most before all our batteries would fail, and then we would be stuck inside the cave where it's always night. I fired prayers through the rock that God would come to our rescue, that he would send someone to us that would lead us to the light of day. Well, obviously, if I'm reading his words, you know that ultimately they were saved. Uh, The leader of this particular group on this particular night Uh, ultimately found one of those markers that uh, he couldn't find before. And finally, they made their way out just about the time that the sunrise was coming up to see the beauty of the sunrise. And I will tell you that the words of the young man that I read to you a few moments ago, he said, that was the last time I ever went spelunking. But can you imagine what it felt like in those moments to feel the sense of being lost? That's what God is describing for us through the Apostle Paul, what we were, what we were before salvation. We were lost. And some will feel that sense of overbearing, burdensome fear as they think about their desperate circumstances, their desperate condition. But that's exactly where God wants us to be if we don't know Jesus. He wants us to understand what it is that we are without him. But then we move to the second point. That's what we were before salvation. I want to talk with you about what we are through salvation. You'll notice he goes on here in verse 4, and the first two two words are the most beautiful words you'll ever hear when you're in that feeling of being lost. But God. Aren't you thankful for those two words? Those moments when you know that but God shows up and God does for you what you cannot do for yourself. Do you understand? That's what salvation is about. Salvation is about the fact that you and I cannot help ourselves. There are no markers that we can find and follow that will take us out of the desperate circumstances that we're in, the desperate situation that we're in. There are no markers to get our way out. There are no works that will get us free. If we die in that condition, we will die in the midst of that fear, and we will die in the midst of that lostness, to be separated from God forever. But God, he became our rescuer. He became the one who came to set us free. And aren't we thankful for him? And notice what he says. This is what we are through salvation. First of all, we're alive in Christ. Verse 4, But God, who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then he's quick to add, by grace you have been saved. He made us alive. What were we prior? We were dead in trespasses and sin. We were cut off from God. What has Jesus done for us? He's made us alive. 
He's made us into new creations in Christ Jesus. He's brought us out of death into life. He's given to us eternal life. And to make sure that nobody misses it, he says it's by the grace of God that we've been saved. It's by the grace of God that we've been saved. There was no other way for us to be, to be made alive but God. If God had not been merciful, if God had not been loving, had, if God had not been gracious, it would have been hopeless for all of us. We would have been lost forever. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. But then look, not only were we made alive in Christ, we're abounding with Christ. He goes on in verse 6 and says, and raised us up together. In other words, the power that raised up Jesus Christ brought us up out of death. It raised us up, raised us up together and made us sit, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I mean, literally, we don't at this moment physically sit in the presence of Jesus, but legally, we've been made to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that you're an heir do you understand that you're a child of the king? Do you understand this is what God has made of you? Those of you who are believers in Jesus, those of you who have had your but God moment, those of you who have recognized he was coming as your rescuer to set you free from your fears, do you understand that he made you alive? All of these are present tense verbs. It means they had a beginning and something that goes on. There's a beginning and it goes on. There's a moment in your life when he made you alive and a moment when he raised you up and a moment when he made you to sit in those heavenly places. Where is that moment for you? When is that time for you? When did you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? He made us alive in Christ. We're abounding with Christ. And will you notice something else? We are affixed to Christ. If you, if you didn't see it, you want to circle these three words. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. Here's the word, together with Christ, verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. You know, one of the phrases that Paul loves to use, and he uses it over and over and over, he describes those of us who are believers in Jesus as being in Christ. We are in Christ so that together he made us alive. Together he raised us up. Together he made us sit. It's all because of Jesus and because we're in Jesus Christ. And the only way we could be defeated, destroyed, or experience the diminishing of our blessings is if Christ himself could be brought down as well. And that will never happen. Are you all with me? That will never happen. You've been made alive once and for all and forever. You've been raised up together with him once and for all and forever. You've been made to sit with him in the heavenly places once and for all and forever. And unless Jesus is taken down, you can't be taken down. What incredible security that God has given to us. What we were before salvation I mean, we were dead in trespasses and sin and walking according to the course of the world and the prince of the power of the air was our prince. That we were living according to the dictates of our anti-God flesh and we were headed toward the wrath of God. We were already under the wrath of God. We were the children of wrath, but God. God stepped in and did for us out of love and mercy and grace what we could not do for ourselves. He made us alive and he raised us up together and he made us sit in the heavenly places. Isn't that great news? You say, how did he do that, Pastor? Well, he goes on to tell you, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... By grace, you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Will you circle three prepositions? The first two are in verse 8. By grace. Do you see it? By grace. Through is the next one. Through faith. What is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God, right? 
It's the unmerited favor of God. It wasn't because you and I were worthy or you and I were deserving. The reason a lot of people reject the idea of salvation by grace through faith is because they simply don't believe they need it. Most American people think that they're good. I'm good in myself. I don't need anyone else to help me. But God comes and shows us what our true condition is, and he says, look, what you couldn't do for yourself, I've done for you. You didn't deserve it. It would have been right for me to have left you to go to hell, but because I'm merciful and I'm loving and I'm gracious, I came. But God, I came and I did for you what you could not do for yourself. Do you understand the importance of grace? that unmerited favor that God has shown to us at some moment in our lives when we began our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that that's the grace of God on our behalf? I mean, that's the incredible thing that God would reach out to us even when we were what we were. That he would make us what we are today through the Lord Jesus and by that unmerited favor. I mean, if it had been by intelligence, a lot of people would have been left out. If it had been by looks, all of you would have been left out but me. If it had been by education, a lot of people would have been left out. If it had been by money, a lot of people would have been left out. But it wasn't by any of those things. It was by something that none of us even deserved, we weren't worthy of. He says it's not of works, not of works lest anyone should boast, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It reminds me of the story of a, a man named Ted, and he died, and he found himself at the gates of heaven standing before St. Peter. And he wanted to know how to get into heaven, how to get in the gates of heaven. Of course, this isn't the way it happens, by the way. But St. Peter said, well, you've got to have 100 points to be able to get in the gates of heaven, and they'll open for you, and you can enter in. Well, Peter said, well, tell me what, what, I, what you did. Peter says, tell me what you did in life, and I'll assign you points according to deeds. And Ted thought for a moment. He said, I ushered at church for 50 years. And Peter said, wonderful. You get two points for that. Ted then said, I, I was married for 65 years to my wife, and I was always faithful. And Peter says, great. I'll assign you three more points. Only three, he said. He was now discouraged by what he was hearing. Then he said, oh, yes, I served in the food pantry and volunteered at the nursing home. And Peter said, terrific, that'll get you two more points. Ted yelled out, two points? At this rate, the only way I'll go to heaven is by the grace of God. And Peter said, that's right, come right on in. (laughs) That's right, come right on in. You don't get into heaven because of what you do, some point system, some scale that you outweigh your bad works but doing good works. You get in one way. You get in by the grace of God. And how do you experience that grace? What is the instrumentality of that grace? It's faith. He says, by grace, through faith. This is the light on the hill. We never want to forget the light that's going to shine from this congregation, and we will never change the message. As a matter of fact, I have been looking back through my sermons over the last number of years. Uh, Some of those, I'm sorry that I preached to you. Please forgive me. But I've been looking back through those sermons and the outlines of those messages, and I went back almost to the beginning, and I've been preaching the same message from the very beginning. How is a person made right with God? By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by trusting Jesus for eternal life, trusting in Jesus for eternal life. It's not through a lot of other things that we add to it. It's not through all the things that we front load to faith or things we back load to faith. It's when we come to that crisis moment in life and we recognize that we need the Savior and we say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. You rose again for me. You made eternal life possible for me. And you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace, he says, you've been saved through faith. And that, that's a a little... A word that's uh, it's in the neuter. It means that uh, it doesn't refer to faith itself uh, because faith is in the feminine. It's referring to the salvation process as a whole. 
That whole process of salvation is not of yourselves. What is it? It's the gift of God. Every aspect of it is the gift of God. Uh, there is no work in faith. It would be no different than if you bought a present and you were going to give it to someone and that person was standing and looking at you and you extended the gift to them. For them to reach out and take that gift from you doesn't imply any works on their behalf. All they are doing is receiving what you were given, the giving to them, the instrumentality by which the salvation of God is imparted to our eternal souls is through the means of faith. We trust in Jesus. Have you trusted in Jesus? That's a message we're never going to change. That it's by grace, through faith, alone, in Jesus Christ alone. But then I want you to see thirdly, what we shall be. What we were was in verses 1 to 3. What we are because of God in his grace, in his mercy and love through faith is in verses 4 to 9. But you notice it goes on, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And here's the third preposition, for good works. For good works. Two things I want you to notice. First of all, we are trophies of his grace. We are his workmanship. We are trophies of his grace. Look back for a moment, if you will, at verse 7. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. Do you know what you're going to be for all of eternity? You're his workmanship. You're his masterpiece. Now, some of us have got a lot more work to be done for that masterpiece to be finished, right? Right? But we are his masterpiece. And why? Because we're going to be the trophies of his grace through all of eternity. Through the rest of eternity, we'll be reminded again and again that we are here, and we're here alone for one reason, because God gave us undeserved mercy and undeserved grace. Trophies of his grace throughout the rest of the ages, he says, will be the exceeding riches of his grace on display for all to be able to see. But then will be testimonies to his grace because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, please notice that he's now using the word works in the, in the positive. In verse 9, he uses it in the negative, not of works. This salvation that comes to our souls, this change of life that comes to everybody who puts his or her faith in Jesus is not of works. But then he says, but it's for good works. In other words, God intends for those of us who are his workmanship, who are to be his testimonies, or to be his trophies of grace for the rest of eternity, that we're to be testimonies to that grace to others by the way we do good works. Good works may be something that we do in the church. Maybe it's something we do for other believers. It can be something as simple as helping a neighbor, loving where you live, helping that little uh, elderly lady that desperately needs something, uh, taking a pie to somebody who's going through a bereavement, caring for somebody who needs a little bit of attention and somebody to pray for them. Those are good works. And God intends for us to be the testimonies of his grace. In other words, friends, what I'm trying to help you see is that you are God's masterpiece. You are his poem. You are his artwork that he has done. You weren't deserving to be who you are or what you are, but God has done it for you by his grace and his mercy, and it's all come to you by way of faith, in faith alone in Jesus I mean, when you think about what God's doing, he didn't start with the most promising materials, right? Are y'all with me? See, this is the problem why we have trouble accepting grace, why the average American has trouble accepting the gift of God by grace because he doesn't really think or she doesn't really think of herself as being that bad. But the reality is that God's design, making us into his workmanship, into his masterpiece, he starts with the most useless of materials. There's nothing worthy in us. There's nothing deserving in us but God. But God. 
in his mercy and in his grace and in his power is able to do something that you and I could never do, no one else could ever do for us and make for us, make of us a masterpiece so that we will be for the rest of eternity the trophies of his grace and we will be the testimonies of his grace in the world in which we live. You see, what I'm trying to help you to see is the grace of God is so incredibly beautiful. The grace of God. When's the last time you stopped and you thanked God for his grace? Did you know that it's God's grace that saved us, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says? But it's also God's grace that sanctifies us, that sets us apart and makes us more like Jesus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And it's the grace of God that sustains us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Remember what Paul said? He had been given a vision and God wanted him to be humble, didn't want him to be proud, and God allowed a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he prayed three times for God to remove that messenger. And what did God say to him? God said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. In your weakness, my grace is seen greater than at any other moment. We want to be strong, and God's grace weak, and God wants us to be weak, and for his grace to be strong. God wants us to understand the marvelous, wonderful message of salvation that God's given to us. And church, this is a message that's in our DNA. This is who we are. This is the, this is the message we proclaim. We make no apology for this message. We make no apology for telling you that we're a light on the hell declaring the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus to anyone who will recognize that today their lives can be changed by that marvelous grace. Thanks for joining us today, and we invite you to come back each Sunday for more messages. If you would like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We would love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.